Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without having been born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of the Lord. I love the story of Nicodemus. It speaks to me. Nicodemus seems to be so much like us. Coming to Jesus, coming to God in fits and in starts. Unsure of himself. Questioning his understanding wanting to go with and yet hesitant to follow Jesus, wanting to make sure he has everything right and knows the proper steps for a proper faith. His character speaks to me. So it does not escape me that Nicodemus seems like he has the weight of the world on his shoulders in what we read this morning. He's just so conflicted, so unsure, something always leading him to Jesus, and yet something always seeming to hold him back at the same time. And it's understandable, really. I mean, what Jesus is asking of him, what Jesus is asking of us, is a lot. And it shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, we want being with Jesus to be easier. We want to go with him in the light of the day, but we often wonder and worry what it will mean for our lives if we do. It would be so much easier if we could just say a few magic words, I believe, and voila. We would be true believers, true followers, and be assured of our salvation forever. But Jesus is asking a lot more than our verbal or even our mental assent to a theological puzzle. I mean, he's not asking us to say the right words. 
He's not asking us to affirm orthodoxy and then live in the assurance of our faith. No, he's asking us to be born again, to be born from above, to be born of water and spirit. Now, being born is something that we all have in common. But most of us, if not all of us, don't remember what it was like to be born. And maybe that's a good thing. I mean, perhaps you've had the opportun opportunity to attend the birth of a baby. Maybe your own, maybe someone else's. Or maybe you've had the privilege to, to see, to witness kittens or puppies being born. This week, trending on social media was a sloth being born high up in a tree. Now, being born looks painful. And I'm not talking about the birthing process. I want to make that distinction. Birthing itself is painful. I can testify to that. But I'm talking about being born. It looks painful. I mean, more often than not, babies come out and they're misshapen. Their heads are all long and stuff. And they're hardly ever the right color. And if they're not screaming when they're born, they're screaming shortly after. Being born is painful, messy business. Being born is often accompanied by lots of bodily fluids, water, blood, sweat, urine, tears, even poop. <laughs> Now, I know we don't like to talk about things like this, and we especially don't like to hear them in a sermon. We don't want to hear about bodily fluids. Amen. But it's lit. <laughs> I don't know what's happening over there, but... <laughs> prudish and more real about the process of being born, then we can better imagine the kind of intimate encounter that Jesus is asking Nicodemus, asking us to enter into with him. I mean, Jesus isn't offering Nicodemus a quick little spit shine to an already almost perfect life. He's asking him to be born again, complete with all of the messiness that being born brings. So it's no wonder that Nicodemus is unsure and a bit tentative. Given the choice, I think most of us would rather not experience the pain and messiness of being born again. Think about it. I mean, when we are born, we're forced to adjust to a completely different way of life than what we've become accustomed to. We don't really have a choice. Our lungs must learn how to function differently. The way we take sustenance into our bodies changes instantly. Our sight and our hearing change, and we must acclimate, we must accommodate. All newborns come into this world in a state of shock and disorientation with complete vulnerability. So of course, of course we would want to avoid that. I mean, Nicodemus wants to avoid it, he wants to think his way out of it. He wants to reason his way out of having to be born again from above. But Jesus isn't about to let him off the hook that easily. This is serious business, Jesus says. There is no way to enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. 
And it's into this context that Jesus speaks his most infamous and beloved verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Now most of the time we hear that passage, we interpret it to be a, a simplification, or at least a summarization of the entire gospel. We see and hear this verse everywhere, from political rallies, to concerts, to sporting events, and in country music songs. For Christians, oftentimes this verse says it all. It is Christianity in a nutshell. All we have to do is take this verse to heart, and we're golden. 27 words of pure promise. Loving God, a cherished world, an unselfish father who is creator of us all, an invitation to everyone, a salvific pledge and life everlasting. All we have to do is believe. What more do we need to hear? Problem is, in the context in which Jesus speaks these words, apparently Nicodemus needed to hear a lot more. If Jesus was trying to boil the gospel down, to make it easier for Nicodemus to understand, easier for him to digest, so that it would save his questioning soul as he wandered around in the darkness in search of a savior, then Jesus fails miserably. In case you haven't noticed, Nicodemus quietly wanders right out of this passage in the same way he wandered into it. No salvific acts today, at least not in the way that we like to imagine them happening. Jesus is left with a dialogue turned monologue, and Nicodemus presumably returns to the darkness without so much as an amen. And all of this begs the question, what is belief anyway? In the Gospel of John, belief is always a verb. It's never a noun. It's a word that does action. It's a word that includes and involves the whole body, not just the mind. It's a word that requires us to give in to it, to give over to it all that we have been, all that we are, all that we have ever hoped to be. A word that requires us to learn how to breathe again, how to find sustenance in new ways, how to see and hear the world and all its people in life-giving ways and to trust that God will show us, that God will show us. It's a word that requires us to be completely vulnerable to the one who doesn't just love us but loves the whole world enough to seek an intimate encounter with every living thing. It's a word that allows us to glimpse God's realm, even while we live and struggle with the messiness of life. It's a word that's almost too much for us to comprehend. So it's no wonder that Nicodemus is not illuminated by this soundbite of John 3.16. He's bewildered. He's befuddled. But here's the thing, <laughs> Jesus seems perfectly okay with Nicodemus' response. He gives him time, he gives him space, he lets him slip away. Perhaps Jesus knows that this is not the end of Nicodemus' story. 
Later in the Gospel of John, he wanders right back into the narrative, not just once, but twice. First, in chapters 7 and 8, when there's an intense conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities, Nicodemus speaks up. A little tentative again, but he speaks up nonetheless. And then again in chapter 19, he appears with Joseph of Arimathea to retrieve and to help prepare Jesus' body for burial. Nicodemus' recurring role in this gospel and how he wanders in and out of John's narrative may be purposeful in and of itself. Faith, belief in Jesus is never quite as simple as we would like to make it seem. At times we feel like we're getting close to it, almost like we know what Jesus is talking about. Our words mirroring Nicodemus' introductory words in our passage, Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And yet then, as we stand close to God's presence, we can't help but realize all of the things that we must unlearn, all the things we must give up, all the things we must forsake to become like newborns. I mean, things get messy when we realize that no amount of education, no amount of authority can get us any closer to God than we already are. Meaningful relationships with anyone, including God, require more trust, require more vulnerability, more messiness than pure orthodoxy or knowledge can ever give us. And that's scary, even for the most educated among us. Like Nicodemus, then, it's no wonder we sometimes tend to wander off, hopefully, only to be drawn back in again by the possibility, by the promise that new life exists. For indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. On this second Sunday of Lent, we're reminded that there are no easy answers. God's love cannot be reduced to a simple formula that does not make a claim upon our bodies. Make no mistake, God wants nothing less for us than to be born into God's realm, that we be willing to encounter all of the messiness and vulnerability that new life requires. Amen. <laughs>